Hi everyone, I am Lab Lloyd Chung from the National Center for Research on Earthquake Engineering and from the Departments of Civil Engineering, National Taiwan University and National Chenggong University. This is my name in Chinese, Zhong Li Lai. Welcome to the course Introduction to Seismic Design of Structure. This is Lecture 4 about damping of structure. In Lecture 2, we have studied the free vibration of a single degree of freedom structure without damping. And we found that once the structure oscillates, it never stops. It will oscillate forever with the same amplitude. But in reality, after earthquake or after typhoon, the structure may oscillate for a while, maybe just a few seconds, and after that, it stops. This is because of the presence of damping. And damping may be induced by the sliding of non-structural elements. Maybe the sliding of the furniture or the interaction between non-structural elements or the pounding between non-structural elements or the interaction between non-structural and structural elements. Maybe there's some impact. Or the sliding between in the, in the beam column joint or the cracking of the reinforced concrete elements. Anyway, damping is really exists in real structure because the existence of the damping, the structure will not oscillate forever. It will stop and it will die out. And here are some terminology. Damping in Chinese, zhu li, energy dissipation, because of the presence of damping, energy will be dissipated. Energy dissipation, in Chinese, lang liang xiao san. Damper, damper is a device that provides damping to the structure. In Chinese, zhu li qi. Viscous damper, viscous damper that provides damping force that is proportional to the velocity. And in Chinese, we call nian ji zhu li qi. Damping coefficient, that's the coefficient that multiply with the velocity, we can have the damping force. In Chinese, zhu ni xi shu. Damping force, that's the force that dissipates the energy. And damping ratio, if we, if we dimension, make the damping coefficient dimension less, then we have the damping ratio. And there's a modification factor of seismic force due to damping. Because of the presence of damping, the seismic force may be less or larger. Damp natural frequency. Once the structure is damping, the natural, def natural frequency may be a little bit different from those without damping. And damp natural period, in the same argument, with the presence of uh, damping, the natural period may be different from that without damping. With the presence of the damping, energy will be dissipated and the energy induced by the vibration will be dissipated by the damping of the structure. And because of uh, energy dissipation, the structural response may be reduced. In general, the higher the damping, the more the energy dissipated and the lower the structural responses and the smaller the seismic force. This damping ratio is different from 5%. And for short period structure, the modification factor of seismic force due to damping is 1 over BS. For one second period structure, the modification of seismic force due to damping is 1 over B1. And BS is the modification factor of seismic force for short period structure due to damping. And B1 is the modification factor of seismic force for one second period structure due to damping. And BS and B1 are provided by the seismic design code in section 3.2. And here's the table provided by the seismic design codes. This is table 3.1 in the seismic design codes. And here is the effective damping ratio, 2, 5, 10 and up to 50. And here's the BS. BS is the modification factor for short period structure. 
and B1 is the modification factor of seismic force due to damping for one second period structure. And you will find that when the damping ratio is 5, Bs equal to 1 and B1 equal to 1. Of course, 1 over Bs is also 1, 1 over B1 is also 1. That means that if the damping ratio is 5%, there's no modification due to damping. If the damping ratio is higher than 5%, say 10%, then Bs equal to 1.33. That means that 1 over Bs may, be, may equal to 0 0.75. And B1 equal to 1.25. That means that 1 over Bf, B1 equal to 0 0.8. Therefore, the seismic force may be less. Yeah. And if the damping ratio is less than 2%, Bs equal to 0 0.8, 1 over Bs is 1.25. That means that the seismic force is scaled up to 1.25 times. And also for B1 is 0 0.8, 1 over B1 is 1.25. Therefore, the seismic force is scaled up to 1.25 times. If the damping ratio is other than that state, suppose it's 8%, then we can find out Bs and B1 by means of linear interpolation. If damping ratio equal to 5%, multiplication factor for short period Bs and one second period structure B1 are 1, that means that the seismic force will not be modified. If we go back to the previous slide, when the damping ratio is 5%, Bs equal to 1 and B1 equal to 1. And if the damping ratio is lower than 5%, then the modification factor for short period Bs and one second period structure B1 are smaller than 1. That means that 1 over Bs is, big, is larger than 1, 1 over B1 is larger than 1, then the seismic force will be scaled up. Say if the damping ratio is 2%, Bs equal to 0 0.8. That means that 1 over Bs is 1.25. B1 equal to 0 0.8. 1 over B1 equal 1.25. That means that the seismic force will be scaled up by 1.25%. Scaled up to 1.25 times. If the damping ratio is higher than 5%, then the modification factors for short period Bs and one second period structure B1 are greater than 1. That means that the seismic force will be scaled down. Say if the damping ratio is 10%, Bs equal to 1.33. Therefore, 1 over B, Bs about, is about 0.75. Therefore, the seismic force is scaled down to 0.75 times. And B1 equal to 125, 1 over B1 equal to 0.8. Therefore, the seismic force is scaled down to 0.8 times. And take a single degree of freedom structure as an example. And the structure can be modeled as mass spring damper system. The mass here is M. The spring is specified by the, uh, by the stiffness K. And here's the damper, and the damper is specified by the damping coefficient C. And Ft here is the external force. And under free vibration, there's no external force, no external force here. And then the vibration is induced by initial conditions maybe initial displacement or initial velocity. And here's the free body diagram of the structure of the free vibration of a single degree of freedom structure. And Ft here is the external force is positive to the right. And if the structure moves to the right with displacement xt and the restoring force will be to the left, that is negative and the quantity is k times xt. If the structure moves to the right with velocity x dot t, then the damping force equal to cx dot t and is negative to the left. 
And from the Newton's law, ma equal to ft. And the force here, there are totally three forces. One is the external force, ft. The other is the restoring force, kxt. This is negative because it's moving toward the direction of the force is to the left. And also the damping force, cx dot t, is also negative because of the direction of the force. And then A is the acceleration. Therefore, it can, it can be expressed as the second derivative of displacement. And then if we move minus kxt to the left, it becomes plus kxt. If we move minus cx dot t to the left, it becomes cx dot t. Finally, we can have the motion equation of the structure. It is mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equal to f. And here's the motion equation of a single, de free, single degree of freedom with damping. And uh, according to engineering mathematics, it's an ordinary differential equation. And it's a second order because of the second derivative. It's non-homogeneous because the forcing function is non-zero. And then it's an ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients because the mass here, m, the damping coefficient c and the stiffness k here are all constants. That means that they will not vary with time. And this equation can be considered as equilibrium equation. This is a force equilibrium equation. And mx double dot can be considered as inertial force. Cx dot can be considered as damping force. Kx dot t can be considered as restoring force. And Ft can be considered as external force. Therefore, the motion equation can be considered as equilibrium equation of the structure, but it's a dynamic equilibrium. Under free variation, the external force equal to zero, and the equation becomes mx double down plus cx down plus kx. Now it's a second order differential equation. It's a homogeneous because there's no forcing function here. If the equation is divided by m, then we can have x double dot plus c divided by m x dot plus k divided by m x equal to zero. And k divided by m equal to omega zero square. Then therefore we can replace k divided by m by omega zero square. And c divided by m can be replaced by two times zeta omega zero. Zeta is the damping ratio equal to C divided by 2m omega 0. Because omega 0 can be written as k divided by m. And finally, we can have the damping ratio can be expressed as C divided by 2 square root of mk. If we consider the damping ratio of the structure, if the structure with the same mass and same stiffness, that means there's the same mass, m, same stiffness, k. The larger the damping coefficient, c, the higher the damping ratio. That means that if m and k are the same, if you have a larger c, you will have larger damping ratio. And the equation of motion can be simplified as x double dot, plus 2 zeta omega 0 x star plus omega 0 square x equal to 0. And according to ordinary differential equation in engineering mathematics, we can let x t equal to exponential lambda t. Then the first derivative become velocity equal to lambda exponential lambda t. And the second derivative becomes acceleration equal to lambda square exponential lambda t. If we substitute exponential lambda t into this equation, then we can have omega zero square exponential lambda t. If we substitute lambda exponential lambda t into x dot, 
then we can have two zeta omega zero lambda exponential lambda t. If we replace lambda square, if we replace x, x double down by lambda square exponential lambda t, then we can have lambda square exponential lambda t. And for this term, we have exponential lambda t, exponential lambda t, exponential lambda t. Therefore, exponential lambda t is the common factor for this equation. And we can take it out and we arrange the equation in this way. Because exponential lambda t is non-zero, no matter what t is. Therefore, the only way to satisfy this equation is lambda square plus 2 zeta omega 0 lambda plus omega 0 square equal to 0. And this equation, this polynomial, there are two roots. Lambda equal to minus zeta omega 0 plus or minus omega 0 square root zeta square minus 1. In general, the damping ratio is very small. Maybe as small as 5% or 4% or 1%. Anyway, it's so small compared to 1. Therefore, zeta squared minus 1 is negative. Therefore, the square root of a negative number becomes an imaginary number. So that we can express this one by square root 1 minus zeta squared times i. And i is the square root of minus 1. It's an imaginary unit. Therefore, we have two roots. Number 1 equal to minus zeta omega 0 minus omega 0 square root of 1 minus zeta square i and the second root lambda 2 equal to minus zeta omega 0 plus omega 0 square root of 1 minus zeta square i and if we substitute lambda 1 into here then we can have the first solution for this homogeneous or ordinary differential equation if we substitute lambda 2 into here, then we can have the second solution for the homogeneous ordinary differential equation. In order to have the general solution, then we can combine these two solutions by means of coefficients. That means that from the linear combination of this solution, we can have the general solution for the structural displacement. And lambda 1 equal to minus zeta omega 0 minus i omega 0 square root 1 minus zeta square t and lambda 2 equal to minus zeta omega 0 plus i omega 0 square root 1 minus zeta square t therefore from the first term we have exponential minus zeta omega 0 t from the second term we have exponential minus zeta omega 0 t therefore exponential minus zeta omega z is the common factor you can take out from the from the equation, from the expression. And then from Euler's formula, we have exponential i theta equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. Therefore, exponential minus omega zero square root one minus zeta square t equal to cosine omega zero square root one minus zeta square t minus i psi omega 0 square root 1 minus zeta square t and this is according to the Euler's equation and then we consider the second term that's exponential i omega 0 square root 1 minus zeta square t and according to Euler's formula we can express as cosine omega 0 zeta square root 1 minus zeta square t plus i psi omega 0 square root 1 minus zeta square t and then we arrange the, these two terms because uh, cosine omega z omega 0 z square root 1 minus zeta square t is a common term and then we can take it out and uh, another common factor is psi omega 0 square root 1, 1 minus zeta square t then we can express the equation into this way Therefore, we can have, we assign c1 plus c2 as a new coefficient, small c1. i minus c1 plus c2 as the second coefficient, 
small C2. Therefore, the structural displacement can be expressed in this way. Therefore, xt equal to exponential minus zeta omega zero t times C1 cosine omega zero square root one minus zeta square t plus C2 sine omega zero square root one minus zeta square t. Why now we have the displacement? Therefore, we can express omega 0 square root 1 minus zeta square as omega d. That's the damn natural frequency. That's the natural frequency of the structure with damping. Omega d equal to omega 0 square root 1 minus zeta square square. And from the damn natural frequency, we can find the damn natural period td equal to 2 pi divided by omega d equal to t divided by square root of 1 minus zeta square. And from this expression, it's very easy to observe that the larger the damping ratio, that means that the damping ratio becomes larger, then omega d, the damp natural frequency, becomes lower. On the other hand, when the damping ratio becomes larger, the damp natural frequency becomes longer. In general, the damping ratio of a structure is equal to 5%. Therefore, the damp natural frequency, if we put, we substitute the zeta by 5%, then we have omega d equal to 0 0.9987% as 0 0.9987 times of omega 0. Therefore, the damp natural frequency is 99.85, of the undamped one. Therefore, if the damping is so light, as light as 5%, the damped natural frequency is very close to the undamped one. Once we have the displacement, we can take the first derivative to have the velocity, and the second derivative to have the acceleration. And we have two coefficients here, C1 and C2 for the displacement, C1 and C2 for the velocity, and C1 and C2 for the acceleration. And if we have two initial, two additional conditions, then we can solve for C1 and C2. Once C1 and C2 are solved, then we can have the displacement, velocity, acceleration of the structures. And here's an example. If the initial displacement is non-zero, and x of zero equal to x zero, and the initial velocity equal to zero, there's x star of zero equal to zero. And from the initial displacement, we substitute zero, zero for t, then we have cosine zero equal to one, sine zero equal to zero. Then we can have c1 times one plus c2 times zero equal to x0. Then we can solve for c1 equal to x0. And then from the initial dis velocity, we substitute 0 for t. Then we have sine 0 equal to 0, and cosine 0 equal to 1. Cosine 0 equal to 1. Then we have minus c1 times zeta times omega 0 times 1, plus c2 times omega d times 1 equal to 0. Then we can solve for C2 equal to C1 zeta omega 0 divided by omega d. And we have already solved for C1. Therefore, we can express C2 as x0 times zeta times omega 0 divided by omega d. If we substitute C1 and C2 back to the equation for displacement, then we can solve for structural displacement. xt equal to exponential minus zeta omega zero t times x zero cosine omega dt plus x zero zeta omega zero divided by omega d sine omega dt. And after observing this equation, we have a factor here, exponential minus zeta omega zero t as t tends to infinity. This term, 
exponential minus zeta omega zero t tends to zero. Because zeta is positive, omega zero is positive. Is positive. Therefore, as t tends to infinity, this term, this factor, tends to zero. Therefore, x also tends to zero. So that we have, as t tends to infinity, this displacement tends to zero. Once we have the displacement, take the first derivative, we have the velocity, take the second derivative, we have the acceleration. And exponential zeta omega zero t is the common term for displacement, for velocity, for acceleration. Therefore, as t tends to infinity, the displacement tends to zero, the velocity tends to zero. The acceleration also tends to zero. And then consider another example. In this case, initial displacement is zero, therefore x of zero equal to zero. And initial velocity is non-zero, therefore x dot of zero equal to x zero dot. From the initial displacement, we have x zero equal to zero, then we can substitute 0 for t. Then we have c1 times 1 plus c2 times 0 equal to 0. So that we have c1 equal to 0. And from the initial velocity, x star of 0 equal to x0 down. And we substitute 0 into this equation. We have 0 plus c2 times omega d times 1 equal to x0 down. Therefore, we can solve for C2 equal to x0 dot divided by omega d. Once C1 and C2 are solved, then we can substitute C1 and C2 back to the equation of displacement. Finally, we can solve for structural displacement. xt equal to exponential minus zeta omega 0 t times x0 dot divided by omega d psi omega dt. And because of this term, as t tends to infinity, the exponential tends to zero. Therefore, as t tends to infinity, <coughs> the displacement tends to zero. Once we have the displacement, then we can take the first derivative so that we have the velocity and take the second derivative we can have the acceleration. And for displacement, velocity and acceleration, exponential minus zeta omega zero t is a common factor. Therefore, as t tends to infinity, xt tends to zero. That means that the displacement tends to zero, the velocity tends to zero, the acceleration also tends to zero. And then we are considering the third example. And in this case, initial displacement is non-zero. x of zero equal to x zero. Initial velocity is also non-zero. x dot of zero equal to x zero dot. And from the initial displacement, x zero, x of zero equal to x zero, we substitute zero for t. Then we have c1 times one plus c2 times zero equal to x0, so that we can solve for c1 equal to x0. And from the initial velocity, then we can substitute 0 for t here, for the equation of velocity. Then we have minus c1 times zeta times omega 0 times 1 plus c2 times omega d times 1 equal to x0 dot. Then we can solve for c2 equal to c1 zeta omega 0 divided by omega d plus, o, plus x0 dot divided by omega d because c1 has already been solved. Therefore, we can substitute c1 equal to 0 here, equal to x0 here. Therefore, we can solve for c2 equal to x0 zeta omega 0 divided by omega d plus x0 dot divided by omega d. Finally, once we have C1 and C2, we substitute C1 and C2 back to this equation, 
then we can solve for structural displacement. Xt equal to exponential minus zeta omega zero t times x zero cosine omega dt plus x zero zeta omega zero plus x zero dot divided by omega d times sine omega dt. And z exponential minus zeta omega zero t as t tends to infinity, this factor tends to zero. Therefore, we have, as t tends to infinity, the displacement tends to zero. Once we have the structural displacement, take the first derivative, we can have the structural velocity. Take the second derivative, we can have the structural acceleration. And we find that exponential minus zeta omega zero t is a common term for displacement, velocity, and acceleration. And as we know, as t tends to infinity, this common factor tends to zero. Therefore, we have, as t tends to infinity, the displacement tends to zero, the velocity tends to zero, the acceleration also tends to zero. So far, we have solved the free vibration of a structure with stamping by ordinary differential equation. We would like to solve the same problem with different methods, that is Laplace transform. <coughs> Here we define Ys as the Laplace transform of Yt. According to definition, Ys equal to Laplace transform of Yt equal to integrate from zero to infinity yt exponential minus stdt. If we multiply yt by exponential at and then take the Laplace transform, then it becomes integration from zero to infinity exponential at yt exponential minus stdt. And we collect these two terms as exponential minus s minus a t. If we compare this term with this term, then we can easily observe that s here is substitute, is replaced by s minus a. Therefore, the transform becomes y s minus a. Therefore, the Laplace transform of exponential a t y t equal to capital Y, S minus A. That means that the original Laplace transform S is replaced by S minus A. On the other hand, the inverse transform of Y, S minus A equal to exponential, A, T, Y, T. And this is called first shifting theorem for Laplace transform. There's exponential, A, T, X, T. The Laplace transform of this term equal to x s minus a. That means that the original tra original Laplace transform s is replaced by s minus a. And here's an example: the Laplace transform of psi omega t equal to omega divided by s square plus omega square. Now we multiply psi omega t by exponential a t and then take the Laplace transformation then we can have omega and s is replaced by s minus a therefore we have s minus a square plus omega square on the other hand the inverse transform of omega divided by s minus a square plus omega square because this one has already replaced s Therefore, the inverse, inverse Laplace transform, we have exponential a t psi omega t. So, the Laplace transform of psi omega t equal to omega divided by s squared plus omega squared. If we multiply psi omega t by exponential a t, then this Laplace transform becomes omega divided by s minus a. s is replaced by s minus a squared 
plus omega squared. And here's an other example. Cosine omega t, the Laplace transform is s divided by s squared plus omega squared. If we multiply cosine omega t by exponential a t, then this Laplace transform becomes s is replaced by s minus a, s is replaced by s minus a, therefore we have s minus a divided by s minus a squared plus omega squared. On the other hand, the inverse Laplace transform of, of s minus a divided by s minus a square plus omega square because here is s minus a, not s. Therefore, we have to multiply the inverse Laplace transform by exponential a t. Finally, we have cosine omega t. This Laplace transform is s divided by s square plus omega square. If we multiply cosine omega t by exponential a t, then this Laplace transform becomes s minus a, s is replaced by s minus a, divided by s minus a squared. s is also divided by, is also replaced by s minus a plus omega squared. And now we consider the free vibration of a single degree of freedom with damping. And this one is the motion equation of the structure. And we have two initial conditions. And here is initial displacement. <coughs> x0 equal to x0. x dot of 0 equal to x0 dot. And then we take the Laplace transformation for this equation. xt, the Laplace transform is xs. x dot t, the Laplace transform is sxs minus x0. X double dot T, the Laplace transform is S square, capital XS, minus S times initial displacement, minus initial velocity. And once we consider this equation, the only unknown is X of S. Then we can solve for XS, X of S equal to X zero times S, plus two zeta omega zero, X zero plus x0 dot divided by s squared plus 2 zeta omega 0 s plus omega 0 squared. Now we are going to find out the inverse transformation of xs. It's very difficult to find out the, to find the inverse Laplace transform of this uh, expression. Therefore we make some rearrangement then we consider the denominator first. For, from the first two terms, we can make the square. Therefore, we can have s plus zeta omega zero square. And then minus zeta square omega zero square to make these two uh, equal. And then plus omega zero square. Therefore, we have s plus zeta omega zero square with this term. Therefore, Therefore, for the nominator, we would, we would keep the factor s plus zeta omega zero. And then omega d equal to an omega zero square root one minus zeta square. Therefore, this two term can be expressed as omega d square. And from the Laplace transform of psi omega t, we have s square here, omega d for the denominator for the denominator. But for the numerator, we have also the omega d here. Therefore, we multiply omega d and then divide by omega d. Then from the first term, there's s plus zeta omega zero, divided by s plus zeta omega zero square plus omega d square. Therefore, we can have a equal to minus zeta omega zero. Therefore, the inverse Laplace transform we have a common term, exponential minus a t, that is exponential minus zeta omega z t. And a is replaced by minus zeta omega zero. And this inverse Laplace transform is cosine omega d t. And then consider the second term. The second term is omega d 
divided by s plus zeta omega zero square plus omega d, and then if we compare this term with this one, omega is replaced by omega d, s minus a, a is replaced by minus zeta omega zero. Therefore, its inverse Laplace transform equal to exponential minus zeta omega zero t psi omega dt. Then that's the solution for the structural displacement. In addition to Laplace transform, we also solve the equation by ordinary differential, differential equation. The result is shown in page 19, the slide 19 uh, in this uh, presentation. Then you can compare these two results. Uh, they are the same. That means that no matter we solve the equation by ordinary differential equation or solve by Laplace transform, and we come up with the same result. Therefore, we are very confident that the result is correct. And here's an example. And we are going to consider the free vibration of a single degree of freedom and with stamping. And the mass here is equal to 2,000 ton. The stiffness, k equal to m times 2 pi square, equal to 789.57 Q Newton per meter. And the damping coefficient equal to 0.1 square root of mk, equal to 1256.6 Q Newton per meter per second. And from the stiffness and the mass, we can find out the natural frequency. Omega zero equal to square root of k divided by m, equal to two pi, equal to 6.287 radian per second. And from omega zero, there's an angular velocity. We can find out the angular as frequency. We can find out the frequency. Omega zero divided by two pi equal to f zero, equal to one hertz. That's one cycle per second. And from F0, we can find out the natural period. That's the reciprocal of F0 equal to T0 equal to one second. And from the damping coefficient, the mass M, the stiffness K, we can have the dampening ratio zeta. Zeta equal to 0 0.05, this is 5%. And also we can, from the dampening ratio, we can find out the damp natural frequency, omega d. Omega d equal to omega zero, square root of one minus zeta square, equal to 6.275 radian per second. And from omega d divided by two pi, we can have the damp natural frequency in terms of hertz, with the unit hertz, that's a 0.9987 cycles per second. And if you compare the omega d here with the omega zero, you can observe that omega d is a little bit less than omega zero. And if you compare f d, it's very close to one hertz, but it's a little bit less than one hertz. And then from the damp natural frequency, we can have the damp natural period. Td equal to the reciprocal of Fd equal to 1.0013 second. With damping, the natural period is a little bit longer than the one without damping. And two initial conditions are given. The initial displacement, x of 0, equal to 0.1 meter. And the initial velocity, x star of 0, equal to 0. That means that we have non-zero initial displacement and zero displacement. And no matter according to the mass of ordinary differential equation or the mass of Laplace transform, we can for solve for the displacement, for the velocity, and for the acceleration. And from the solution for displacement, velocity, and acceleration, and it's easy to find out that the frequency, the frequency of vibration are the same. 1.9975 pi. That's the frequency of vibration for displacement. It's also the frequency of vibration for velocity. It's also the frequency of vibration for acceleration. And here are three parts of the displacement, the velocity, 
and the acceleration. And we have to check whether the results are reasonable or not. First of all, we have to check the initial displacement. From one meter, is it reasonable? It's given by the problem that the initial displacement equal to from one meter. And check the initial velocity. Is it equal to zero? And then it's given by the problem. And then check the initial acceleration equal to minus four meter per second square. And then you have to check it out from the solution for acceleration and substitute t equal to zero to find out the whether the acceleration, the initial acceleration is very close to four meter per second. And from here, when t equal to zero, this is one, this is one, this is zero. And this is a 3.9478 meter per second square. Therefore, the initial displacement, the initial velocity, and the initial acceleration have the values as we expected. And then check the period of vibration. It's about one second to complete one cycle of vibration for displacement, for velocity, and for acceleration. And then we check the damn natural period is 1.0013 second. That means that it's very close to one second. And then as time goes by, the amplitude of vibration becomes less and less. And then you check, you have to check whether, whether the, the rate of uh, decreasing is reasonable or not. Then we found out that the amplitude of the vibration decreases with, decreases with time. And you have to check out that whether it's reasonable or not, or is it what you expect. And here are some references. The first one, the first reference is a seismic design codes of building that's uh, written in Chinese. It's published in uh, 2011 by Ministry of Interior and you can download the seismic design code from this website. Another one is the ordinary differential, differential equation. You can find out from any textbook on engineering, engineering mathematics. Another one is the Laplace transform. You can also find it out from any textbook on engineering mathematics. And there are some videos. That's the videos for lecture 2.1, and here's the video for lecture 2-2, and here's the video for lecture 4, that's the current video. And the English one will be uploaded soon, and this is the Chinese version. And in this lecture, we talk about the damping of structure, and with the damping of the structure, the structural response decreases. And once it accelerates, you will not accelerate forever, and you will die out as time goes by. And the quantity of damping can be dimensional, this can be made non-dimensional by damping ratio. Their damping ratio has no unit; it's a non-dimensional quantity, and it stands for it represents how much damping there are. And from the from this lecture, we learn how to find out the damp natural frequency and the damp natural period. In general, the damp natural frequency is a little bit less than the one without damping. And the damp natural period is a little bit longer than the one without damping. And also we have the free vibration. We have considered the free vibration of damp single degree for freedom structure. And that's all for this lecture. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye.